within internet governance. This data is then presented in the gender report cards, and I will share with you uh, the data from Internet Governance Forum 2021. This was hosted in a hybrid format with the overarching theme of Internet United. When looking at the participants, 48% of the attendees identified as females and 1% identified as others. 51% of the attendees were male. For IGF 2021, while there was no data available on session organization, uh, organizers' responses to the question on whether the session reflected specifically on gender issues. Um, we did infer uh, the data that's presented here from session descriptions in the session reports that organizers submit um, after the completion of every session. From the session descriptions, it seems that 10 of the sessions or 5.8% um, had a direct engagement on the topic of gender and internet or reflected on gender issues um, a, as a whole, 17 sessions or about 10% had a partial focus and most of the sessions, 84% of the sessions had no engagement or direct reflection on gender issues. Um, what One of the things we also collate is the gender div diversity among speakers and participants in the different sessions, but for IGF 2021, um, we weren't able to do that. As we can see, um, one of the things we do is also just look at the uh, the increase or decrease in the engagement of um, uh, of gender issues in the different sessions. Um, as we can see, there has been an overall decrease on the engagement of gender issues in IGF. Although there is a caveat that um, this analysis might not accurately reflect uh, the level of levels of engagement uh, with gender as there was no direct data available um, uh, on, on the question of reflection on gender issues in each session. Um, so yeah, that's just a very quick uh, overview of the dynamic coalition as well as the gender report cards. Over to you, Smita. Thank you so much, Shohini. The reason <clears throat> we started with the presentation of the gender report cards is because it's one of the key, um, you know, intersessional activities that the Dynamic Coalition on Gender does. And it's a really important and very visible measure of like how gender is being spoken about, how many women are there in the room, um, and what more do we need to do to improve this, right? There are things that need improvement in this that we recognize because the recording of gender in the report cards is still in the binary. And this is something that needs to be improved upon if we really want to be inclusive in how we understand gender in the IGF and internet governance spaces. And with that, we will dive into the session. So I'm Smita. Uh, I work with the Association for Progressive Communications in the Women's Rights Program. Uh, with me, I have some fantastic speakers. Um, I have Chennai from Mozilla. I have Liz from Kiktonet. Uh, I have my colleague Sheena from APC. And I have Srinidhi Raghavan joining us remotely from Rising Flame. Um, now, a context to this session itself. Why are we doing a session on who's watching the machines at this point, right? Why the session? Why now? And why here? Um, this the, the the key the overarching theme for this IGF is looking at building resilient, shared, sustainable internet. And I'm really happy that you know some of the themes really looked at addressing emerging technology and AI, because what happens when we have internet governance and tech uh, work uh, and digital rights work is that sometimes we kind of get stuck in the current, and with technology that is dangerous because technology moves so fast that if you're not already talking about emerging technology and how that's going to impact your communities and countries, um, sometimes you get left behind or like, you know, from the very beginning. Um, why now? Because um, this is a very pivotal moment in, uh, in a uh, moment in which in, in many of our countries, because a lot of our governments are suddenly paying a lot of attention to technology. They're also paying a lot of attention to emerging technology and seeing how they can use it, particularly surveillance technology um, and um, you know, digital ID systems, facial recognition, artificial intelligence. Um, so as people working and looking at internet governance and digital rights, it's essential that we start looking at it um, more carefully and also bring in um, you know, our experiences, our knowledge, the learnings from our communities right away 
um, right now. And why here? You know, yesterday in the opening ceremony, it, the opening ceremony went on for about 90 minutes. Um, in the 90 minutes, women and LGBTQ persons were mentioned once, right? Um, in building a resilient, shared, sustainable internet, if you're mentioning women and you know, LGBTQ person once in the opening ceremony, what sort of resilient internet are you building and who is this sustainable for, right? And this is why I think it's important that we speak about it here. Um, with that, I, uh, and, and one last thing is uh, the reason we have brought together speakers from different spaces um, and backgrounds is also because um, when talking about emerging technology, more often than not, even now, the onus of making it perfect is on individuals, which is not the way it should be. We need to shift the onus of doing better regarding technology and you know, its intersection with rights. Uh, we need to shift that onus onto systemic change and structural change, right? Um, with that, let me ask the first question to um, the great speakers we have here. What are some emerging technologies that you see impacting your communities in your region or country in the near future? Um, Liz, can I start with you? Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Smita, for that uh, great introduction. Um, I'll talk about our work at Kiktanet and also partly um, about the research work because I'm also a fellow at uh, a research fellow at Research ST Africa. Um, so we, our work at Kiktanet started uh, with training women on digital security. And then uh, we've started realizing that they don't engage so much, especially when you talk about women politicians. Uh, we see all around the world uh, women are not represented in governance, especially political, when, when they try to, um, let's say, seek political seats. And uh, more of them have been trying to seek political seats. But one thing that has been discouraging them um, is the algorithms, because they are mostly attacked online, uh, also because of uh, the patriarchal norms that exist in society. And uh, so as much as individuals are the ones who post on social media, uh, social media amplify uh, these kinds of posts. And when they're attacked, uh, women are attacked, they are also amplified online. And why so? I think it's because of the business model, advertising model, um, social media companies are trying to uh, to, to create algorithms that amplify what, what people like or what people engage in. And uh, it just happens to be also uh, women abuse online, especially people who are trying to, to seek political seats, uh, is the, one of those uh, content that are actually amplified. That, and this really, really affects how people um, or how women and other genders uh, actually seek political office because they are impeded by this, uh, by these attacks. So, what you are trying to uh, uh, to to seek is a change of this. Discourage such business models. Explore other business models uh, where um, where where there's no harm actually, uh, and especially on a minority of the population, population that is actually disadvantaged. Uh, so what you're trying to do, we are trying to do more research and we're trying to do more campaign about this, but uh, it's actually just a pinch of, of the ocean. It's just work that is, is starting. As you say, this is an emerging technology and it, we've just noticed it, especially in La this my recently concluded general elections. Thank you, Liz. Um, Chennai? Thank you so much, Smita. Um, hi, everyone. So thank you for that question. And when I think about the future from where I come from, locating myself in Southern Africa, um, and then also being mostly interacting in East Africa as well, is that realization of potential increased bias based on more and more importation of technology specifically for surveillance cameras, um, you know, in the, in the case of improved personal security and state security. So we see a lot of surveillance cameras being deployed um, in countries, but 
the question is who owns the data? And this was a question that was actually raised in the previous panel. Um, there have been conversations around like who is actually, where is the technology being procured? So there's a concerns around transparency because it seems as if we are getting technology in our regions for the tra sake of training, um, training the technology to be able to better recognize black faces. And then it's imported back for someone who's like, great, it works better and doesn't deal with bias. And I think another point of con concern is always data variance. So increasingly in a research project that I've done personally looking at how African feminists are engaging with data, there's serious concern about how does my gadget know where I am. I mean, I love the convenience, but why is it that I feel like I know there's consistently someone who's watching me and talking about, you know, responding to if I have a conversation, the next thing you know, it's coming out on my Instagram page. So these are the realities of people then having to deal with the fact that there is increased surveillance as they navigate spaces. And we know that um, surveillance has always been a tool of control, particularly from a patriarchal perspective. If you don't fit the box, there's increased um, watching in terms of of what you're doing and then there may actually be policies and regulation put in place for more control and more moderation. I think an example of this is oftentimes um, shadow banning through content moderation because what you're saying is not considered in line with the issues of hand. So, um, and then another thing with work that's been done by Mozilla, really thinking about privacy not included, some of the apps that are put out there um, as a way for people to respond to say for example thank you. say for example to um, mental health issues <laughs> Sorry. Uh, mental health issues and then you find out that actually the app you're trusting with your most personal information does not include privacy and you're unaware because as much as we're all experts in this room or people with um, varying knowledge of information how many of us actually read through the terms and conditions and really understand how best to address the issues so that's my intervention in terms of the concerns coming up thanks Mita. Thank you, Chennai. <coughs> uh, Shiniti, can we come to you? that is being uh, contested at present or being introduced in uh, in this conversation and one of the big things around this has been around disability organizations really asking questions around where is this data being kept? Who is, um, I mean, how is the system wired against or able to detect or create spaces for disabled people to even access these systems in the sense that do, I mean, and, and because all of this, all of these access to all of these services is often linked to the extremely contested uh, uh, biometric uh, ID card that exists in India, which is called Aadhaar. And that system, which was built keeping the non-disabled body in mind, it doesn't necessarily take fingerprints of folks who have cerebral palsy or who have uh, retinal detachment or who perhaps have one or two less fingers have are amputated. So the system itself was wired to see the person who is receiving the ID card as a non-disabled body. So then when the, when the disabled body interacts with this system, then we see that there is an immediate hindrance of access to services, right? So in many ways that the technology itself that is being presented as a quote-unquote savior for disabled populations is the, is the technology that we are content, we are pushing against, right? That we are fighting against because we are not able to access the things that are needed, right? It takes up to sometimes over a year for somebody to access a, a disability card, which means then that they don't get pension for that year or they don't have access to the educational system, which would give them, uh, which would mean that they get further delayed in comparison to their non-disabled peers. 
so in many ways when it comes to disability technology is offered as a solution as a way to bridge the gap between disability and non disability and what we are actually seeing is further hurdles because the technology that was created was created using or envisioning the non disabled body mind and not really uh putting uh the disability uh, in front and center uh in the system so um i think so some of these are are emerging conversations of how then that would impact um disabled people's access to health uh or health insurance which is a system that automatically removes disabled people from it as non eligible for health insurance because of our existing uh conditions and uh lived experiences so i think these are some of the things uh emerging from within this context and i'm sure it it's similar in other contexts uh as well thank you shinidhi shina do you thank you smita uh good morning still everybody uh my name is shina i work with the association for progressive communications uh thank you <laughs> uh and I'll say something Kenyan say I mine is to say something small after everybody has said a lot of profound things um I think it's important in a space like this to talk about the fourth industrial revolution which is um which is a narrative that's pushed in many policy spaces that presents technology as this big equalizing moment for especially africa that the, the biggest solution to all our problems is um more technology uh, but also less oversight less accountability and that the more africans have access to technology the more we develop um and i, I know very many um women's rights and feminist scholars have already uh, disrupted the language and the ideas of development for who um so when we push uh new technologies in contexts that are void of accountability void of um equity void of um representation we are just widening the gaps and widening the the lack of access um so for instance in in the previous panel uh, held by policy there was an intervention from the floor where somebody said that well um it's kind of pointless to come to these spaces and have conversations about ai in africa when we do not have enough ai engineers um but without investigating who are these ai engineers uh which which bodies do they hold which biases keep getting built into additional technologies um and so mine is to just bring it down to um interrogating further some of the language that we bring into the spaces that we push and we think that technology is this equalizing thing in a very in, a, in an already deeply unequal society thank you shina and thank you for bringing up the 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 comment from the previous session because i also think that a lot of times when we talk about technology if we wait for everyone to understand it to have a conversation about it this implicit hierarchy forms in which like only those who understand it in the in the in a technical sense are the only ones who are allowed to talk about it right and it will never be that everyone understands it completely for you to then go about to have a open conversation which is multi stakeholder which is from different countries and communities um my um next question actually is 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 related to uh, this one which is um what do you what are some of the lived experiences of marginalized communities um when engaging with new tech and ai and how does this shape um our rights freedoms voice um and you know and 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 i know that in a current context it may seem like i'm leading towards like it's always bad but it's not sometimes it can also be good um and to also recognize that right um the reason i'm asking this is because uh sometimes when we talk about technology the lived experiences of people who are, are being impacted by the technology is often the last thing acknowledged and 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 addressed in it um for example in india right now there's a lot of movement uh, by a lot of money put in by governments state and central governments towards facial recognition softwares and towards cctv cameras and this is of course for the protection of women and children because you know they both have to be protected together um but they never asked the women if they want to be protected and if cctv camera is something that makes them feel safe in fact research shows that when there is cctv cameras present in a locality women actually feel further unsafe and they feel like their free space has now been taken over by surveillance right and when you're saying cctv cameras and facial recognition as a method for safety 
um, who are you leaving out and who are you throwing under the bus, right? Because facial recognition inherently has a race color bias. And in our countries, color has different contexts. Color has context of safety, right? Which is because of uh, patriarchal caste structures which exist in our countries. So when, and, and um, so when you're using a flawed technology where, which has bias baked into it, and you're saying that this is for safety and then this will be used for judicial processes, um, who are you throwing under the bus, right? Um, increasing research shows that facial recognition most misidentifies black women. Um, even more than that, and in recent researches, it shows that non-binary and trans identities are like recognized, uh, are misidentified almost 100% um, of the time, right? So uh, a non-binary person who is dark-skinned, um, they are just like, they are a criminal always according to the same system, right? And, and this intersection is important to observe when we are saying that this technology is being used for your safety, as the government tells us all the time. Um, similarly, what are some of these experiences that you have encountered um, when working with communities? Um, Chennai? Thanks, Mita. Um, so I think for me, what is quite significant is looking at the work that we do at Mozilla Foundation around open source technology and responding to the reality of voice technology. So I'll use that example of the bias that exists within current voice technologies where oftentimes the lived reality is if I was to speak uh, in the way, if I was to speak in my home language, which is Shona, and if I was to speak in like the way that I speak Shona, my device would not be able to recognize me. So oftentimes we find that most, well, if not all of the current uh, popular voice technologies do not recognize um, different accents that are not American or refined European. They also really are biased towards women. So even if you do have an American or European accent, if you speak to your device, um, you know, it's not going to recognize you. But if you've got a partner with a deeper voice who may happen to, who most likely is maybe male, um, it will respond better. So there's sort of like this reality of voice is seen, having voice technology is seen as a solution to disrupt um, the technological space and also increase interaction with devices so that people can have access to information. So we're seeing a lot of solutions um, in the space that I exist in where voice is being pushed forward as a way in which to overlay current technological solutions to access information. One of the ways then, you know, thinking about the positive aspect and then being reflective of these biases and existent discrimination with the current voice technologies is through a common voice project we create open source data sets where one is actually a where we track for representation for gender where we infer it from male and female people who do sign up for the project um, and we also are currently working on building up East African languages and one of the things we've really been intentional about because I think whenever you're building up a new technology, particularly emerging technologies, is really to be intentional and have people from diverse backgrounds in the room. So it's not just the machine learning engineers or fellows, it's not just the person who's writing the policy, but people who are able to then work in communities and come back with points of concern. So privacy is often raised by people, uh, particularly African women, where the question is, what are you going to do with my voice? Because we really rely on people contributing their voices to the open source data set so then technologies can be built up that are responsive to the different accents and, bi and ways of speaking that people have. And so we've really been working to address the question around privacy in terms of being transparent of where the data goes, who is going to be making use of it and how we can actually we continuously think about how can communities who contribute to this open source voice data sets also benefit in the long run in addition to answering the question of privacy so just to sum up um, I think when you think about emerging technologies there really is a concern around the harms of bias um, and discrimination emerging then when we think about using them as solution through an open source perspective there really is in need to be intentional about addressing concerns of transparency and privacy but also future long-term thinking of how can marginalized well, communities actually benefit from the data or use the data in the way that they see best fit Thank you, Chennai. Liz, you wanted to respond to this? Yeah, thank you, Smita. Um. Oh, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Smita. So, one good thing about artificial technologies is that 
the more you use them, the more they learn your preferences and how you work with them and they kind of adjust themselves uh, to your patterns of usage. Uh, but the other thing is uh, access and uh, you know access also affects us along gender lines and uh, uh, we, we actually have um, disadvantaged communities along along uh, challenges of access. So when uh, women and uh, minority genders uh, do not use these technologies, um, maybe because of course affordability or maybe because just of societal norms, it means that then there's no data to actually learn what their preferences are and how they use technology. That means future development of technology is not going to take care of how they would like to use the internet. So we are really leaving them behind. Uh, so that uh, that's one point about um, usage uh, that is really coming up important even as we talk about um, uh, the biases. There's also that bias that will also come about because we really don't have data uh, about this other uh, population. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> it becomes like a continuous loop because you don't have data, you, it doesn't work, and because they don't, yeah, and then you're biased. Thank you. Um, Sheena, over to you, and maybe I can focus the question a little more um, because I know that you work on freedom of expression and uh, civic spaces. Um, is there some lived experiences of communities that you have seen in relation to this particularly, or broadly is also cool? And I, I don't know if this is the right place for this intervention, but I think it's also important to, um, and I think I'm, I'm jumping on what, uh, what Liz just said around how the more, the more you use certain kinds of technology, the, the more the, the machine learns. But I think there's also, there isn't enough room to refuse to use. So when we think about um, uh, COVID, yeah, and uh, when uh, you had to still move around during COVID, um, you had to fill all these uh, digital documents that track your movements, that say where you're coming from, where you got your COVID test, and um, there was no, there was no choice. There was no, and there's something about that that I think fundamentally for very many communities who have criminalized identities. For example, if you are a trans identifying person or an LGBTI person in a political national context where your identity or your sexual um, gender identity expression is criminalized, um, and this is some information that they, they, they try to fish out of you, you, this limits your ability to participate in certain spaces or you have to lie you have to say yes i am you know a cis uh, heterosexual woman even though that's that's not how you identify or that's not how you live your reality um so there's something also about how the technology is is forced on uh, communities without understanding the complexity and the nuance of our lived experiences that is quite problematic um, and therefore you could argue that some people choosing not to help the machines learn is an act of resistance um, because you would be lying anyway in in a political context where you cannot be yourself definitely and especially if the like you said the effect of helping the machines is going to be long term um, like, for example, in India, I know that persons with, uh, who are HIV positive uh, refused to like sign up for Aadhaar, which is a digital ID system in India, because there was news that they were going to bring in a health ID system, which would then be merged with Aadhaar, which means that their very identity will be linked to their HIV status, which is something they could not risk getting out um, to their families. But this meant that they could not vote because um, the government tries to force you to have Aadhaar card everywhere. They could not access um, vaccines when the COVID um, pandemic happened because they ask you to submit Aadhaar again um, and make it intentionally more difficult when you don't submit it. You know, um, Sriniti, over to you. Thank you, Smita, and, and really taking from what uh, both you and Sina were saying around um, what it this means in terms of um, what we disclose and what we don't disclose. Uh, in, and this is but very pertinent when it comes to disability, is that a lot of the emerging technologies and AI that are there right now are meant for us to, uh, meant to, I mean, 
find uh, uh, parallels or be able to quote unquote detect disability um, in others. And we know this is a fact that that there is this widespread disability discrimination everywhere and that automatically detecting disability is going to have harmful impacts on others. But it just comes back to this conversation of what it means for a person, like you were talking about the, UH, the, the universal health ID that is being pushed in, uh, in, in the Indian context. One of the things is that they want to streamline all health services. But this also means that, say, people who live with psychosocial disabilities or mental health, mental illnesses, um, are often denied uh, medical insurance because of the fact that they are not deemed as fit or able to access that service. Um, and now, because of the streamlining of this, of these systems, or being able to detect when somebody has a disability or uh, using uh, standard ways of understanding how disability presents, like if, if, if it is like I'm not able to make eye contact or I'm, I, I have difficulty phrasing certain sentences, etc., resulting in people providing a diagnosis for me through the uh, system that is, that is existing and this is becoming popular for not just uh, governments to do, but for private organizations to do, etc. And what that means in terms of me maintaining privacy or um, deciding when I would like to disclose my diagnosis, but also other implications of accessing services and uh, requirements which will automatically, which where I will automatically be deemed unworthy because of uh, the system having a prior set of um, uh, classifications of who is fit to access these things. So in many ways it, it, it falls out because having to disclose disability is at the core of being able to access uh, reasonable accommodation and accessibility needs of the community. But when that, when that disclosure is weaponized or when do we against us by excluding us from these spaces, but also what that dis what who gets to make that disclosure and when is, is shifting rapidly because of the presence of technologies and creation of new technologies that is able to quote unquote detect disability or uh, find who is disabled, right? And what what harms that would cause. And the premise is that it's going to help us. Uh, create a more inclusive world, but we do know that that as a society there is heavy stigma against disabled people. So, is it going to create more inclusion, or is it going to create systematic exclusion? Thank you, Shriniti. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute and open up to the room. Are there any questions from people in the room? You can just unmute your mic. Yes, please. You have to unmute or press that button. Okay. Sorry. And just start here. But that's okay. Thank you so much. Apologies for it. Um, so I'm coming from the Observant. We are um, your responsible technology institution, and we're trying to look at the issues uh, that you have mentioned. So I would like to um, ask, what do you think are the challenges and issues that you face when it comes to holding technology companies accountable? Because uh, these are companies with a lot of revenue, a lot of manpower, and they could just hire thousands of smart people uh, to address those issues. Um, what do you think their stance are, and what can we do uh, for a better internet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question? Then we can take a couple of questions and then ask the speakers to respond. Okay, no other question. Um, Who would like to respond? All of you? Okay. Liz? <laughs> 
Thank you for that question. Uh, challenges uh, of holding technology companies uh, accountable. You said it, money. Um, so, <laughs> we, we're, a civil society, uh, I think, you know, we, we just act out of passion, and sometimes you're limited with funds. And on the other side, we have uh, someone who is so determined to make profits and can do whatever they can to make those profits. Uh, so that means they can also hire a big uh, workforce, like you said, to do whatever they want. Uh, the, the other power they have is lobbying. So we can lobby our government from a citizen point of view, saying that these techn technologies are harmful and uh, do not make these kinds of leg legislation or make this. But they, they also use money, and especially uh, some of our countries, our politicians love money, and those legislations uh, just go. Uh, another one is understanding among the public, because sometimes uh, we, t we try um, we try make the companies accountable by empowering uh, the citizenry. And uh, I, I can talk about some of our experiences uh, campaigning for um, privacy, uh, respecting uh, technologies. And we started this work as early as 2007, around there, uh, talking about privacy. And uh, when you start campaigning for it, people will start asking you, uh, if I'm a good citizen, what am I hiding? And things like that. So it took some time for, for, for people to understand um, what privacy is, what is it, uh, what is in, in it for them, and all that. And when people don't understand, then it, it also becomes hard for civil society to actually try seek these kinds of ac accountability. Yeah. Others can add. Thank you, Liz. Chennai? Um, just adding on to what Liz said, I think it's also important about the geolocation dynamics. So, I'll give you an example. South African government summoned WhatsApp, uh, one of Meta's companies last year, was it this year, when they rolled out the new privacy policy. They didn't come to the table. They do have offices in the country, but, you know, they took their time because generally where they're located, they're like, do we really need to go? So is South Africa a big enough market for us to listen when we're called? And again, when you frame it from that geolocation perspective, what people get under GDPR when you travel to Europe will be completely different from what you get, even if your country has a data protection law, because there are 33 African countries with a data protection law in the African continent. So you recognize that structurally we exist in a world where there's still that global north and global majority dynamic where they respond to where the money is and where the market is, right? And so even if there's political will, because oftentimes so many of the conversations in these spaces around capacity building of policy makers and regulators, but the reality is they do have political will to be able to call out and try to hold these tech companies accountable, but you know they're going to respond to a political representat representative from Europe who they think is likely to be able to give them a lesser fine um, you know, because the fines are quite high, but if they're being fined by an African government, then they do the quick conversion from dollars to rands. It's, you know, small change. We don't care. So I think for me, it's, it's really accountability challenges around that geolocation, that as long as they feel like they don't have to respond to the laws of that country and they're located in a different place, it's going to be a long journey until collaborative work is the only way we can get to have these companies accountable. Thank you, Chennai. Um, in relation to that, another thing is that sometimes um, when we're trying to hold companies accountable, often it's civil society doing it alone because tech companies and as more and more as technology is being used to influence elections in different countries, um, politicians and governments don't have the incentive to support the citizens, right? They have more of an incentive to support the tech companies. They would rather work, um, you know, go, get in, uh, go along with their lobbying and, you know, convert it into votes rather than, and it almost feels like the civil society is um, challenging both the tech companies and the government simultaneously. They, they blend into like one symbiotic entity. Um, and that is one of the big challenges I think today, uh, because the tech companies can give them something which we cannot, which is votes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. 
Um, hi, my name is Nomshato Luis Ngosungulu. I'm sitting here wearing two hats. Um, so one question is from our UNECA youth on our social media pages. The second one is coming from me directly. So the question um, from the member is saying, as Africa, is our multi-stakeholder strong enough as we are approaching these issues? As we all know, we're coming from different countries, our approaches are different, and we have quite a silos um, almost approach when it comes to dealing with tech companies. The second question, um, as I say, comes from me. I come from Media Monitoring Africa, coincidentally in South Africa as well. And um, we've been quite robust in engaging um, the tech companies that were mentioned. And one of the things that happened was um, in our recent elections, we actually got the tech companies to come to fall when it comes to uh, combating mis and disinformation during elections. So you then found um, government, civil society and tech working together. That was, um, for me, a first step of obviously a very long way to go. But my realization in that is when we are all coming together and engaging about such a matter, whether we're coming from a perspective of decolonizing the internet when you're looking at race, gender, etc., or we're coming from a a point of data protection, which is now obviously coming into my privacy, uh, my data as an individual. No one reads T's and C's that are too long. Um, what's, what's happening there in terms of simplification, for example, those have been the discussions that have been happening around there. But my interest is our strategic thinking as, as the different stakeholders is almost different. Civil society obviously is coming from an activism point of view, human rights approach point of view, whereas government might come in from a different perspective. And obviously tech, it's all about revenue. Uh, everyone sitting here is almost like a money bag, you could say, um, as much as we are um, in a platform that is there for us to exercise our freedom of expression. However, at the end of the day, we do need those uh, platforms. We do need um, you know, them to be able to reach out on that global scale and to be able to interact with one another. Um, so yeah, just what, what are your thoughts around that? Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I was volunteered. <laughs> um, I think in terms of thinking about multi-stakeholderism within the African continent, and that was a fantastic question. The reality is that I think it's like a slow-paced change. I've been part of the Internet Governance Forum space since 2015, and a lot of things that I've seen emerge in terms of policy cohesion and response to trying to hold technical companies accountable has been that long, slow journey to then be able to have um, companies, technical companies in these spaces to have a conversation on these issues. Um, now putting on my Mozilla uh, Foundation hat and corporation hat as a technical company that is working towards good of the internet and trustworthy AI. I think for us, we recognize the importance of community right from the beginning. So yes, multi-stakeholderism is, is stemmed with power issues. It's stemmed with people being able to access spaces. But there are companies such as Mozilla where we do try to facilitate spaces to have collaborative working groups. Um, and one of the things that we have every year is the Mozilla Festival. And next year, we're excited to actually have Kenya House, uh, Nairobi House, Fest. And in that space, we try to bring in builders, is what we call the technical community, policy makers, um, civil society, to have a supported and collaborative conversation in terms of like what's the innovation intervention that we can put together. So to respond to that, and the question that emerges, emerged is, there are multiple spaces where multi-stakeholderism has actually been able to shift the conversation. I think the importance of that is to be able to weigh what point are you getting, where are you trying to get with the conversation, and take that slow journey. Um, and then on the last point that you, you reflected on, I think it's quite, it's, it's really important then to use the multi-stakeholder platform, which is what it's designed to recognize that people have different starting points. At the end of the day, I think uh, this year's topic around ensuring a resilient internet is an end point that as we decide that we're going to put in interventions around a resilient internet, how do we recognize that? What is the government's position and how do we hold them accountable and how do we support them? But also locating it into that political context of um, sometimes stakeholders have their own agendas. 
So at the end of the day, it's it's really kind of like what do we get from each other, and not try to you know turn a government entity into a feminist organisation because they're never going to do that, except for the Canadians who decided that they're going to have a feminist policy. So they've been able to influence other government stakeholders to think about gender from a feminist perspective. So it's really trying to have that strategy of who can help on the different agendas that we all hold. Thank you, Chennai. Uh, Shriniti, you wanted to respond? Um, uh, I think also that um, with regards to uh, large tech companies and um, disability in specific, um, I feel one of the hurdles is that we are often as a community stuck with access because um, often accessibility needs are not necessarily met. And so um, we are not able to go beyond um, um, that in terms of conversation and deepening uh, concerns that might be uh, um, present. Like how do we envision consent when it comes to um, disabled people's uh, uh, access to these spaces, etc. You know, and I think one of the uh, things is also that, I mean, it's true for all our communities, but um, within disability, because of the diverse uh, set of needs and uh, uh, disabilities, and the fact that context plays such a huge role in um, access to many things, like in the Indian context, we struggle to talk about disability and technology because of the widespread poverty, which results in um, limited access to technology and especially the internet, right? Um, but I think that the conversation um, would be, it would be important for us to move beyond the uh, conversation and use not just accessibility as an entry point, but to think about other ways in which um, we can imagine um, how disability is um, um, impacted in these situations, right? Like I was reading a study recently, which was done in the US around using AI to decide whether somebody is fit for um, um, jobs or not. And one of the big, big problems in that was the existing working system had such few disabled people that it deprioritized hiring of disabled people or it used metrics of uh, productivity and um, other things which work against the disabled people, um, like how long it takes for somebody to navigate a platform which might be very slow for somebody with cerebral palsy or high support needs. So um, these kinds of markers that are defined within the system and within technology uh, companies are often going to work against disabled people because of the lack of conversation around these things. So I think um, moving away from thinking about it just from the lens of accessibility is essential for us right now because the technology is already developing further and it's beginning to work against the community in very, uh, well, not good ways. Thank you, Srinidhi. Um, so let's get back to the panel. Um, so um, in terms of freedom of expression and civic spaces and <coughs> spaces where discourse and conversations take place, how is this affected by emerging technologies? Right? Um, Chennai, you already mentioned some work which was done around shadow banning. Um, if you could expand a little more on that and um, others who want to add in on this particular topic. Because I think when we look at the technology, the, one of the key things that's often told about technology is that, oh, this is where everyone is equal and everyone can speak, right? But this is a very easy like sort of idiom to like throw around. But is it actually true? And with technology progressing at like breakneck speed, how is, how is this being affected? How are rights online, uh, especially in terms of expression and association being affected here? Um, who would like to start? China? Hmm? China. Uh, thanks for that question, Smita. Um, and it, it ties in very closely to the work that we do at the Association for Progressive Communications in the Women's Rights Program. Um, earlier this year, I had the privilege of attending um, a gathering um, in uh, Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, that was looking at decolonizing the internet. Um, and what was profound about this meeting was, I guess, uh, meeting and interacting with whose knowledge. And it's, it's, a, it's a civil society organization that looks at whose knowledge exists online. And I came across an interesting factoid which ties into this question. So for instance, um, 
Google estimated in 2010 that there are about 130 million books uh, published online in at least 480 languages that we know of. In a world of 7 billion, then, now we're 8 billion, we've been busy <coughs> um, speaking nearly 7,000 languages and dialects. We estimate that only about 7% of those languages are captured in published material. And so when you think about just that, the fact that um, a large percentage of the information that exists online excludes a considerable amount of the world's population, which would primarily be Global South. It presents um, a very a skewed um, understanding of who holds what power to shape narratives online. Um, and this power plays out also in digital spaces when we come to, let's say, a more local context. So we look at, say, Kenya. Um, in Kenya, you'll find that majority of the people online are likely to be cis heterosexual men who have the resources, who have the resources in terms of the technology, who have resources in terms of um, the ability to earn money that can buy enough data for them to go online and insult you. And then you have a situation where you have um, a woman or a gender, an, I guess a visibly or an, an out gender non-conforming person that's taking up space online, expressing themselves, saying just about anything, yeah? Um, and then this attracts um, vitriol and violence in the digital space. Um, very similar to the offline space, the same violence that non-conforming bodies that experience carries on on the online space. And so when we look at um, freedom of expression online, it's severely limited. Um, when Chennai was speaking about, let's say, community standards on certain platforms, who's the community and whose standards? And by and large, it's going to be whatever the decided conservative norm is, um, that's the standard. And the community that's enforcing these standards is going to be people that conform to what the, whatever this norm is. So this creates just a, an endless cycle of the continuation of violence online. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't take this uh, opportunity to, for instance, look into um, Special Rapporteur Irene Khan's uh, report on the promotion on, and protection of the right of freedom of opinion and expression online, which is a very, it's a groundbreaking document because it brings into sharp focus the particular violence that non-conforming queer women um, identities and bodies online experience. And it's a very important piece of, of um, of, 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 of thinking and coming together and work and, and I guess multi-stakeholderism. It's, it's multi-stakeholderism in practice when we have um, mandate, mandate bearers who um, create space for uh, civil society and people who are living the experiences of violence online to come together and say that the violence that my black, uh, Kenyan, queer, tattooed, bespectacled, short-haired body would experience online um, plays out very differently for somebody that isn't me in those spaces. And I think it's important to, to recognize that. Thank you for that, Sheena. In fact, yesterday, after I tweeted from after the, about the opening ceremony, there were some comments that came in my DM, uh, which were saying, you know, you're in, a, you're in our country as a guest. You should not be complaining. And I was like, why is this in a DM? Why couldn't you tweet this to me? But, you know. Um, <laughs> Chennai, would you like to respond? <laughs> I guess the DM is safer. Um, <laughs> I think um, just to, so in the inverse um, of what Sheena said, really thinking about also the reality is one of the strategies that people have employed is as we set up the community standards, um, the question that you raised, it's the ability for people then to use the community standards to silence um, people who are gender non-conforming, people who do not fit into the heteronormative, which are usually women and, um, and LGBTIQ people. So then what you find is a lot of times mass reporting is used as a tool to silence people on the platform. In American context, quite recently, someone posted, discovered a WhatsApp or Telegram group where people had collected um, I think democratic, what they called democratic uh, Twitter platforms, and they were planning to mass report. So obviously this Telegram group probably has about 2,000 people in it, and the plan was then once we have them, you know, we shut them off the platform 
And then that raises the issue of who's actually doing the content moderation at the back end and are they looking into the context to nuance why is this particular uh, um, page getting this mass reporting and looking at it in that political context of what's happening because oftentimes what we find is well the algorithm should be correct so if you're reported if we get 2,000 triggers of a mass report I'm not sure you know I stand corrected then we take the the page down or we put you in the sin bin until you're okay and then we bring you that but what we've seen a lot of is 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 really the mass reporting again affecting a lot of like people who identify as feminists, people who identify, who go against the grain, then having their pages taken down. And that also then raises a challenge that a lot of us, because of the affordability issue, engage on social media platforms. That's where our discourse happens. We don't have resources to be thinking about maintaining a website where a discourse can happen and maybe because the structure of the website doesn't allow for that conversation to happen so where do we go to find our community we go to social media but the social media community standards meant to protect us actually end us end up harming us so that is the the context around thinking around freedom of, of expression and the current platform dynamics that exist thank you chennai i just want to add two short things in this one is that in this you know now because the session is also being on youtube streaming um, I know that for a fact. If I, you know, if if I'm supposed to, go, if I post about this session on Instagram and say that, hey, this was a session where they mentioned Palestine, where they mentioned um, internet shutdowns in Kashmir, immediately the number of views I get on this post would be infinite, like will be one fourth of what it would otherwise be, mm -hmm. right? And when people are more, and and as more and more people are reliant on online space, spaces and social media platforms for livelihood and income, um, are they allowed to speak about it? and without economic repercussions on, on, on themselves, right? Another is one of the most um, recent um, examples of how technology was used to silence people is what happened with Muslim women in India. A lot of vocal Muslim women, uh, vocal online and Muslim women journalists, um, their photos and identities were taken without their consent, put on an app which was hosted on GitHub, and they were auctioned. And this was used as a way to shut them up because they were speaking up against the government, they were speaking up against extremist Hindutva ideologies which were becoming more and more prominent in the society. Um, this was shut down the first time and then within, within barely two months, uh, uh, another app came up using the same source code from GitHub because GitHub didn't think it was important to take it down, right? Um, so when we're talking about intersectionality, this is important. Because just because someone is, um, you know, for open source software does not mean that they understand the intersections of who a particular particular open source app is affecting. Um, and after this also, the, the, the curious thing was that most of the writing around this came from Hindu upper caste women, but not from Muslim women themselves. The conversation which was happening with Muslim women were happening in close spaces. So this means that there's also, you know, after this invasion on their freedom of expression, um, when they tried, uh, the, the, the experience that they felt in one going and complaining to police and getting a, fi uh, a complaint filed to how they felt with the, dealt with this mentally uh, in, in terms of mental health, um, what were the impact on their, um, you know, how, how this led to further self-censorship and self-silencing online just to avoid this um, incident again. All of this was not uh, recorded by Muslim women themselves. And that's a problem, because then who's speaking about whom? Um, and this is a very big element of freedom of expression which is not spoken about as well. Um, hopefully now there will be more research coming out around this by Muslim women themselves, which I think adds a really important voice to any sort of work and, and, and knowledge produced around this. Um, going to the next question, because, um, and when we look at big data, because um, any conversation around emerging technology is kind of incomplete without talking about big data, right? Um, and data algorithmic processes. Do you think the binary codes, the, the data right now, is able to hold the multitude of identities that we share, the, the intersectional identities that we share? Um, what is, and, and, and how do we avoid this binarification that happens when data is collected? Because um, yes, on one hand, there needs to be horizontal data collection to make sure that policies and, and laws and, and schemes that are influenced by data collected um, is inclusive. But on the other hand, data also want to fragment you. They want to put you in boxes, right? Um, how, do you, how do you reconcile with this, this, this uh, dichotomy which exists? Liz, would you? 
Uh, that's a very important question uh, because um, sometimes you want to be represented, but uh, sometimes the process of that representation be, becomes um, quite challenging for, for minority of populations. Uh, for example, um, in countries, for example, uh, um, for a lack of a, of a good example, UK, uh, most of the time you're reminded that you're a black American when you're filling out a questionnaire. Uh, because yes, it's important for them to get that data, but on the other hand, you're, when you're seeking medical services and uh, services where you don't understand why your de identity comes in, then it makes you question why why should I reveal this identity and would it affect me if uh, I give this kind of data? So yeah, there's that balance, but I think we need to think critically uh, how we are going to implement it without um, actually uh, hindering uh, or affecting uh, what we really want to get out of uh, such processes. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Um, Shina, Shina? Oh. Uh, Shinidi, on to you. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I, I think it's also a complicated question because as, as uh, activists working in this space, one of the big things we, we realize about disability is that we don't have enough data around it. But um, like we were saying that data often collected when it is not uh, 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 when it is not uh, dealt with in terms of uh, privacy or we don't take into account how it features in our uh, perspective. One of the problems then becomes is that it is weaponized against the groups that are that we're collecting data against, that we're collecting data about. Right? For instance, there was this uh, study that was done in the in the US, which basically saw that there was there was a company that was collecting user data around uh, disability. And one of the things that it ended up doing was that, um, I mean, general user data around disability. And one of the things it ended up doing was that it would deprioritize dis disabled people's applications during hiring processes, right? Because it didn't fit those ideas around who gets to be hired, right? Uh, or who fits the roles that are most productive, quote unquote, productive or most valuable, quote unquote. So all of these uh, um, implications mean that the data that is being collected often is not in the best interest of the community. And if it is not in the best interest of the community, how are we perceiving um, the larger uh, uh, space around who, I mean, how we are able to use this data? Right. In addition, one of the things is that we don't often don't know that data is being collected about us. And when we don't know that data is being collected about us, it, it implies that there is a, um, a power in play in order to be able to challenge whether this data is, is actually there, right? Like for instance, the AI system at this particular company, I think it's called Higher View, was challenged by is that the user is seen as the employer. So the employer has all this data about disabled people and who works and who doesn't work and what are the characteristics that make them better fit for this organization, et cetera. And the disabled person doesn't know that this data is being collected, one, because it's being collected within the system. And two, how do you challenge when you don't know that the data is being collected or what is the data that is being collected against you, right? So the only thing that is clear for us is that the data is, of course, built on biases and stigma that exists in society. And we already know the biases that disabled people are burdens and we aren't going to be productive in workspaces. So by default, you know that this is being built into the system. So um, um, so one, that's primarily the, I, the, the struggle for data is that we would like data to be able to build an inclusive society, to have better systems that help and support disabled people in workplaces. But in reality, that that we are aware that that data that is being collected about disabled people is going to be used against them in these spaces. So it complicates our, our relationship to data and who's collecting it and what are the implications of that. Thank you so much, Srinidhi. Um, next, let's look at policies. 
how do we think about policies around emerging technologies? Do we want to reject certain technologies? Like, for example, um, if I'm not mistaken, there's a city in San Francisco where they have said that CCTV cameras with facial recognition are banned in public spaces. Um, and there is, and I want to bring in another question which has come from an online participant, Caroline, who has asked, do you think there's a need for a, a transnational human rights instrument that would be legally binding for multinational corporations such as tech corporations? Um, what are the poli policy solutions do you think would be needed to make sure that the development of AI is inclusive and non-oppressive? Um, yes, <laughs> Sorry. so thank you for that question. I think when we think about policy, especially as I've been reflecting around the policy space with the work that's been mentioned around, say, for example, digital ID, um, thinking about AI strategies, the previous panel talked about um, a whole focus on developing AI strategies for selected African countries. A lot of the starting points I think we should start with is why. Right? Because the why then determines the kind of policies that we're going to get. A lot of the times, especially with the artificial intelligence conversation, fourth industrial revolution um, conversation, the why started from an economic growth perspective. So the point was, you know, you have a strategy or you respond to AI and you develop the necessary policies in order to regulate, regulate emerging technologies so that you can be seen as converting the famous um, World Bank quote of 10% of 1% investment equals to 10% growth or vice versa. I'm not quite sure, but that's a very popular statement around uh, if we invest in technology, this is what's going to happen at a GDP perspective. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, it's also a lot of the times policies are, are put in place and strategies from a perspective of research and development um, pushed by academia in the computer sciences, in like the computer sciences department. Fantastic. Okay without a doubt but a lot of the times it's kind of like so how do we innovate like how do we cleverly build these cute robots that are going to like walk around the streets and everyone's going to love them but we're not going to give them guns we're going to give them grenades <laughs> i actually read a tweet this morning about those cute like dancing robots from mit um so there is that like innovation of of research and development and usually connected to like state security and military con points and then also policies are put in place for the perspective for the point of participation in global spaces, right? A lot of the work that's been done around data protection on the African continent was in response to the general data protection regulation from the European um, bloc. It wasn't necessarily driven by the contextual needs of protecting privacy and data, uh, respecting privacy and data within African states, but it really was, if you want to trade with us, if you want to hold our people's information, show us your privacy, your data protection policy, then we can talk. So clearly, when we think about um, policies for emerging technologies, there's a need to locate the why, and then if we're going to have policies that and regulations that are aware of harms in place and issues that need to be addressed, they really need to take on that multi-stakeholder or being pushed by civil society as what we've seen with online gender-based violence <laughs> policies that have been put in place in current laws. It's because there was a need to recognize that tech does not, you know, the online space does, is not an equalizer. All the current policies that we have around gender-based violence also need to recognize the online platform. And that's how we saw uh, non-consensual intimate image sharing actually being put into policies uh, connected to cybersecurity and data protection. So the regulation is important. The question becomes where does it come from and how do you ensure that it does not replicate harms as we've seen with the facial recognition challenge. Thank you, Chennai. Liz? Yeah, the question was about. Huh? Yeah, the question was about. The transnational, yeah. If there should be a multinational body which will hold um, tech companies accountable. Use my <laughs> Apologies for that, and now I'm becoming the chair. Um, so, responding to um, why don't we have, or can't we have um, some kind of international treaties uh, to bind um, technology companies uh, to, uh, to like respect human rights? Um, I think. There are some initiatives where we uh, we have tech companies actually coming together, form some kind of uh, uh, was it is it guidelines or something like that uh, where they follow. But uh, 
the methods of assessment, how they assess each other, uh, I think some of those examples, I wouldn't want to mention some. Uh, I think they're kind of inadequate. And then this brings me to a question of uh, then who puts them into accountable when they come together? Uh, and if uh, some of them, let's say, uh, don't uh, respect human rights, what kind of action uh, should be taken and who should take this action? Because again, these multinationals are registered in countries and they follow country laws and uh, where also um, these guidelines, uh, let's say a country has uh, do, uh, doesn't have a right respecting law or uh, might uh, put the company in a position where they'll, uh, they'll have to, let's say, uh, do things like um, enforcing an internet shutdown and uh, such rights uh, abusing uh, actions, uh, then what kind of balance should they follow? Because if they don't uh, like follow, uh, let's say, government uh, um, requests to internet shutdown, then they're going to be re deregistered. But on the other hand, if they do that, then they go against these laws. So who comes first, the one who they're registered under or these other treaties? Then I think the best approach is actually uh, to work with intergovernment organizations to actually um, come up with these laws so that nationally, then it trickles down nationally to actually hold them accountable as these uh, treaties are domesticated. I think that would be the right approach, but uh, uh, it's not a single one solution. It's expired. We are playing musical chairs along with this. Um, thank you very much for that. And I, um, I'm really glad you mentioned like who who are we, like when we are saying like asking for a multinational body, who is the people then, right? Because um, because I live in India, I'm very scared of asking for more policy and laws always because this is, <laughs> our government usually takes that as a chance to, oh, we can sneak in another surveillance thing in here. Oh, we can, you know, use this to control how people are speaking about us online. So um, I, I personally believe like <clears throat> asking for legal reforms based on what is existing right now is also a good point to start when working with governments. Um, also because um, in India what they do is also that they take offline regulations which exist, they are very lazy about it, yeah? They copy paste it into an online thing and put it under the Information Technology Act and say that this is the law for technology. Which means that, um, you know, anti-sexuality laws which, which are talking about obscenity and things also get replicated in your freedom of expression online. Um, legislations, it's a, it's a big problem. Um, we still hold on to the British words of obscenity, prurient, lascivious, you know, all these sort of <laughs> language. Um, my last question to all of you wonderful speakers is, <clears throat> when we talk about advanced technologies, what happens is that sometimes we forget that um, we've already done a lot of work, yeah? Uh, it's not that everything has to be reinvented. The wheel doesn't have to be reinvented, as they say. Based on that, what do you think are some thoughts, learnings, principles that we can take forward from ancestral technology, from the work that we are currently doing, um, looking at rights and technologies. Um, how do we embed pleasure, care, rights into how we are imagining and thinking about emerging technologies? Um, because I think like sometimes, um, particularly for women and queer people and persons with disability, technology is seen uh, as only for practical use. You know, you will use this for applying for examinations and applying for jobs and for doing your job. But you forget that, you know, the internet is not only for practical purposes. It's also for pleasure. It's for joy. It's for connecting, right? And it, it's for talking. Um, how, do we, how do we make sure that we, we hold on to these values, thoughts, and what are some of these which we want to carry forward when we're working on emerging technologies? Um, Sriniti, can I come to you first? Sorry. Um, I think one of the things that when you were asking this question, I was smiling and thinking about was also because a lot of, um, and this whole thing that's been happening with Twitter and um, um, we could see a lot of disability Twitter, which is large, large groups of people who are disabled and organized online, um, feeling really upset and scared. Uh, about what it, what that implies for community for many of us, uh, especially because other forms of organizing often can might not be accessible. 
so might not necessarily be able to have in-person meetings and um, or engage in uh, things that are are more possible. Um, but one of the uh, uh, one of the things that really stands out is that in, apart from the fact that the internet and emerging spaces does provide for different forms of community and organizing, but also that, um, that often when we imagine, especially in the conjunction of disability and technology, the premise is almost always to fix the disabled person, to make them as non-disabled as possible so that they can exist in society. Um, you know, the, the attempt is always to, to use technology to make that possible, right? And one of the things that we have, I mean, one of the things that, that is helpful for us to think about is where that is coming from and what, what that means when we infuse these ideas of um, using technology to meet certain ends, but also to remember that at the core there are still people and how do we enhance uh, community and care and stuff, right? Like just to give a small example, there's a lot of AI now that that is being deployed on images and um, um, especially on meta platforms like Facebook and Instagram, where the image automatically uh, creates an auto image description for blind, low vision, and screen reader users, and it, it, it's, it is a way of making that space accessible and that, that has its own um, benefits and um, um, learnings from. Um, but it's also about the fact that we are in many ways trying to replace the human aspects of that, right? Of making spaces accessible, of creating uh, spaces where we are all welcome and uh, present. And I think that it's important for us to think about why we would like diverse societies and where everybody feels happy and welcome um, is not just so that they can participate in society better, which is a great end, but also that we can all be together and learn together and enhance our uh, understandings of each other and grow together, right? So I think um, just thinking about how we think about technology is not really as a replacement to uh, or trying to fix a problem of some kind, but more so about how do we um, build more uh, collective spaces for us. Thank you, Srinidhi. Sheena? Thank you. Um, I think, <clears throat> so one, I like, I like that we're ending this conversation by like shifting the focus away from oh, what's wrong, oh, all these horrible things, oh, we are suffering, oh my goodness, um, towards what do we want more of? Um, which I think in civil society spaces, especially like feminist ones, is something we do a lot of. We, we, we try and shift the focus away from um, this is all that's horrible towards this is what we want more of. Um, in the different spaces. I think it's also important to remember that um, technology and innovation is not new to the human experience. We have been, I think for as long as human beings have existed, we have been innovating, we have been um, doing, trying to, to, to develop, we've been developing technologies. Yeah, and, and I think the speed with which current, you know, uh, tech shifts and changes and the uptake, you know, a new thing comes out, everybody's on it, um, is testament to this, that there is an inherent need to want to do more with more people better. But the issue here then becomes um, how this inherent interest in participating in the development of technology and the use of technology is then manipulated by corporates, by states, um, towards limiting people's access and people's ability to participate actively as who they are in these different spaces. And, and I guess that's what brings us to these spaces to say, um, uh, where is the choice? Where is the option to participate so far in uh, particular technological advancements? Yeah. Yes, we love tech, but what if I only want to participate so far? Where is the right to, to choose how far I want to participate in particular spaces? And uh, where, is the, where is the agency of my being in these spaces to, 
to do to do that. Um, and also, I'd be remiss if I didn't also take this opportunity to talk about um, um, young women, especially young women and and young uh, queer gender non-conforming people, um, because because this language is not going to be used in many spaces. We're taking as many opportunities <laughs> <laughs> to throw the language in in this panel. Um, yeah, who take up space and face incredible amounts of violence um, online uh, by simply posting a TikTok video of them dancing, um, posting jokes, posting um, um, ideas, posting just anything on the internet that doesn't um, stay in line with what society had, you know, very patriarchal, old-fashioned society had decided is how we are supposed to live as good people or good women or whoever whoever or however people identify online and young women are are truly at the at the battlefront online yeah and are sometimes cannon fodder because um, the attacks are fast and furious and there's no solidarity there's no support there's no recourse there's there's nowhere that they can go to 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 um, find voice and find support um, so it's important to say that you know we see you, um, and it's 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 important for the rest of civil society to recognize that um, they're defending an inherent freedom for all of us, whether or not you agree with what a lot of young people are doing online. But there is an inherent freedom that is being protected in these spaces that is important to talk about. Thank you so much, Sheena. Liz. Thank you. I hope my mic. No. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you for making me chair again. Uh, so a lot have been said about tech for public good, and I'd just like to emphasize that. Um, Chennai talked about um, the drivers of bad policies, uh, R4D and things like that. And I think it's also time we start interrogating drivers for bad tech also. Of course, um, e economy uh, or political economy uh, has to be in, um, researched wider because uh, profit making is a very big motive. But there's also another one for e tech as an excitement, uh, innovation also as an excitement. There's a time where we had IoT, uh, inter Internet of Things, where tech people were connecting, connecting basically everything, including pencils. If you could connect food, uh, uh, that if it was practical, we, we could have connected food also. But why don't we have these technologies? I think it's because um, the market didn't receive it well. And who's the market? Uh, I think it's us. So if we understand our, our rights better, I think we'll be able to drive um, what we want uh, also through what we buy and what we use. I think uh, uh, another, another way we can, we, we can try or voice out what we really want is by interrogating really what we buy and knowing what we buy. Uh, read privacy policies, know um, how your data is being taken, what companies do with your data, and any other thing. Make an informed uh, decision. If you're not going to educate the end user, then I think we'll still be drumming um, we'll be drumming whatever we are drumming right now for a very long time. So back to Mike Musical Chairs. Um, so I think thanks, I mean, just adding on to everything that the, uh, my fellow panelists have said, which is very exciting, again, emphasizing feminist and patriarchy and queer community and all of that representation, because it's very important. At the end of the day, uh, building on, on the drumming analogy, it's really that importance of looking at innovation, looking at technology as a space where we can have fun. I will, the two examples, um, just to add on to, to the point of thinking about fun. When people started looking at how um, people from the global majority were making use of the internet, people would find that they were making use of the internet to date. 
So they had access to the internet, they would go on websites, they would find love. There was a lot of um, sense of, oh wow, why are you not using the internet to get a job from the academia space because of the utility of the internet. But now we found people have innovated and they've made Tinder and Bumble because they recognized the pleasure aspect of these platforms and then they created and innovated in that response. So I think it's important for us to, you know, so that's one example. Another example is when TikTok came and a lot of people who, um, sorry to Facebook folk, but you know, that's the reality. Um, a lot of existing technical companies thought that TikTok wasn't going to last because A, you didn't need to sign up on the platform to see, and you still don't, to see uh, the content that was there. And you would create content um, at the beginning where you could do anything. Now I know there's problematic content moderation algorithms. So they thought it wasn't going to last because what is this business model where we're not capturing you on the platform? Subsequently, what did we see? Instagram tried to recreate TikTok. So at the end of the day, it's really important for us to, especially from the global majority, because a large number of funding, a large number of innovation drive is respond to the SDGs. Um, think about how are you going to solve issues for your grandmother in the rural areas. But my grandmother also just wants to have fun, mm -hmm. in the words of Cindy Lopa. Um, <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, um, it's really, I'm happy that we're ending on this note of pleasure and thinking about how do we ensure that there is increased participation for people to be aware of their digital rights also because they're doing it as a matter of I don't want you to steal my joy so now how do I make sure that the innovation you're giving me allows for me to have as much fun as I can but at the same time call out my member of parliament who's about to get a loan that I do not agree with so that is my summing words thank you so much Chennai. you know a friend of mine says that any uh, any website can be a dating app if you try hard enough <laughs> it's like that um, and on, on, on TikTok, um, I'm really glad you mentioned that. So India has banned TikTok right now. And uh, what is important is that when TikTok was still allowed, it really subverted who is creating the videos. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you see people from, um, you know, uh, lower economic classes, those who don't speak English, creating these content where they're just enjoying, right, and having fun. But when it was banned, there was no uproar about it, mm -hmm. right? And that is really funny because if Twitter was banned, um, there would have been an uproar in the country. And that really tells how we think about freedom of expression and the intersection of that with class and caste and language, right? Uh, why was TikTok not seen as a space of freedom of expression when Twitter is seen as that? Um, and, and that is an important question for us to also reflect on as, w and, and this is what I would take away from the work that has been happening so far and like from ancestral technology is that I think we need to be really careful that we don't create the hierarchy in what is good freedom of expression, essential freedom of expression, and what is not, right? Because when it comes to, if we create this hierarchy, you know, political freedom of expression will be completely agreed. Everyone would say, this is important, we must protect this. Religious freedom of expression, we must protect it. Sexual freedom of expression, no, no, how can you send nude photos and say that is freedom of expression? But it is, right? And that's what I would carry forward in whatever technology we are, we are, we are, we are bringing forward, um, stop, you know, you need bread and roses, both. It's, it's that, right? Don't just tell me that this technology will help you live better. Um, is it making me and allowing me to live happier? Is it helping me connect with people? And that is what I would carry forward. Um, thank you for being here in this room. And I know that we are about six minutes over time, but we started late, um, so I will take this. Um, thank you to the panelists and speakers. Um, Um, I know that we are very close to lunchtime, so if there are any burning questions or comments that anyone wants to share, we can take two minutes for that. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Florence. I am an ICT Access and Equality Fellow for Persons with Disability at the Kenya ICT Action Network. My comment to the disability discourse is that Persons with disabilities, we are willing to be involved in the design of new tech from the design stages so that the output is something that works for us. Otherwise, we risk oh, once again losing the independence and going back to social exclusion, which is something we advocated so hard against. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sorry, who? Yes, please.
Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Fadla Adams. I'm with the South African Human Rights Commission, and I'm joined behind me by colleagues from the Ugandan Human Rights Commission. Thank you so much for the discussion. We stepped in a few minutes late as we ran over from another um, discussion. But just to highlight the integral role that national human rights institutions play, um, there's a lot of discussions around civil society, but NHRIs are a key interlocutor between civil society, the public, and the government. Um, there are 86 A status, or rather 83 A status NHRIs, um, and that means that they have speaking rights at the UN uh, Human Rights Council. So I would really encourage uh, tech companies, policymakers, um, government representatives to ensure that there's a seat at the table for NHRIs because we do engage on the ground. Many of us have a built-in equality portfolio which deals with issues around um, persons with disabilities, older persons, SOGI rights, um, so uh, LGBTI, um, Q plus categories. Um, and in relation also to, there was a comment made about a treaty, a possible tech treaty. Uh, these kind of mechanisms, it takes so long, at least a minimum five to eight years, if not a decade and longer, to get a treaty off the ground. So we need short-term solutions. Uh, but what I can say is that perhaps there are ongoing discussions around looking at business and human rights, and perhaps that's an entry point. Uh, there's currently the forum happening, and I found it bizarre that it's happening at the same time as this, because there are colleagues who were split in two ways, not knowing to go to Geneva or here. But there's definitely a need to integrate it and maybe look at how do we have a BHR-based perspective, um, business and human rights within technology. Um, and then at the same time, bring in your NHRI voices who do engage um, and, and that can give a lot of insight from a different perspective and that can use the platform. If we're looking for some kind of traction at a UN or international level, your NHRIs also have the voice to speak on agenda items at the council level. Um, and so that might be a very good route to elevate your country or issues that you want to bring to the attention of the council or any of the thematic mandate areas. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's all for now. I want to encroach on the right to food and lunch time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, all right. Thank you for your comment, and, and that was um, you know, really glad like we could hear you. Um, okay, let's close the session and go to eat. I hear some rumbling stomachs. Thank you very much for being here, and see you around.